How's everybody doing? You girls doing good? Give me just a few more minutes. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited. I'm just going to bring a little word to you tonight, and then we're going to go party out there. And, and I really prayed through, you know, what does the Lord want to say to us tonight at Sisterhood? And, and so I want to share probably what's a really familiar story to you. I want to share with you about the woman with the alabaster jar. And now as I share the story about the woman with the alabaster jar, I just want to encourage you because I think you're going to pull some new things you've never seen in this story out. And that is my heart. Every time I teach the word, my greatest excitement, my greatest joy is to show something that maybe you never saw before in that story. I love when God does that for us. And so can I ask you to set aside what you thought you knew? about the alabaster jar. Can I ask you to set aside what you thought you knew about the woman? And in fact, you're going to learn a, a few different things. There were multiple occasions that this happened in scripture with different women. But I'm going to show you just a few things. So let's read this passage together. I want to read to you from Mark chapter 14. Now I'm picking Mark chapter 14, but what I want you to know about this woman and this passage and this story is you can also find it. We, they have the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know that. There's four gospels. And so we find the story in Mark, but Matthew also has written about this story in Matthew chapter 26. That's not what we're going to use. And then there's another time that this story is written about in John chapter 12, okay? And so I'm going to read Mark chapter 14 verses 1 through 9 to you. And here's what I want to say. As we read this, John chapter 12 gives us details that Mark 14 doesn't. And that is it tells us who the woman in the story is. And the woman is Mary of Bethany. Okay, I want you to remember that. Let's read the story together. It says, now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people, they would riot. And so while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman, the Mary, Mary of Bethany, came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of nard. She broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. And so some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. And Jesus steps up to the plate and he says to them, leave her alone. I don't know how you pictured Jesus saying it, but I assure you Jesus wasn't playing. In that moment when his daughter was getting messed with, he wasn't ready to play. Can you just let that rest on you for a minute? I don't know what you're going through. And I don't know what's up. And I don't know who maybe is coming against you. But just know Jesus isn't playing when people mess with his daughters. And so here he is and he says, leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Well, of all those verses that I read, and I've been studying it for a, probably at least a month and a half for this, I've been just reading it over and over and over to see what the Lord would let pop off and pop out to me. And of all the verses I read in there, there was one particular verse that I've been wrestling with. There was one particular verse that I could not move past. There was one particular verse that stopped me in my tracks. And so let's look at it again. It was verse 9, the very last verse. It said this, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in her memory. Hold up just a minute. You mean to tell me wherever the gospel of Jesus is preached, anywhere in the world, for the rest of history, every time it's preached, you're also going to know about this woman. I had to ask myself, what in the Sam did this girl do that would cause the Savior of the world, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to say, any time that my name is preached, you're going to know about her. What in the world did she do 
that would want, Jesus would want to make sure that her story would be told anytime his story was told. That anywhere in the world that his name was mentioned, that her story would be told. What did she do? Aren't you wondering? I mean, don't you want to know? I couldn't get past that. How is it that every time the gospel, the good news, the message of salvation would be told in any place in the world that we would hear about this woman or we should know about this woman? What did she do? What did she do? What did she do? You ready for it? You want to know? Here it is. She did what she could, Jesus said. (laughs) She did what she could. Let it rest. That every time the Savior would be preached, every time that salvation would be taught, Every time, in every place, in any nation, in every language, in any, re- any time in history, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about a woman from Bethany. Why? Because she did what she could. She did what she could. She did what she could, Jesus said. I love that. Here's what I want you to know. For some of us in the room today, That is going to set you free. You're going to let that bring some peace, some rest. It's just going to settle you. Because you realize, because so many of us have this picture of what we have to do for it to be meaningful. I assure you, you would have never thought that if you just did what you could, that your story would deserve to be told when the salvation message is given. Never, never did it occur to you that it was that important to Do what you can. She did what she could. And it's going to rest some of us today because we're going to stop, and we talked about it already, this comparison. Here's what we do. We watch everybody's Instagram posts. And you know know the lady that went to Africa to start five orphanages and took three truckloads, you know, they call them the container loads, and delivered clothes all around to all the villages. And here I am. I can't even deliver matching socks to my kids' drawers. I mean, What in the world? But I see that post and I think to myself, well, her story deserves to be told. She's making a difference. Jesus has to be pleased with her. She did what she could. She did what she could. Now let me say, but for others in the room, I hope it challenges you. I hope it stirs you. I hope it jolts you as it has me. Because we need to get honest. Have I done what I can? I better be honest. Have I done what I can with what God's placed in my hand? Have I done what I can? She did what she could. And I love it, and I want her story to teach us today. And so here's what I want to do. I want to share with you because I want to look back over this woman, Mary of Bethany. Let's look at her life and see what did she do. There's three different areas that I want to show you that she did what she could in. Here's the first area because we're going to learn from it tonight. The first area that Mary did what she could in was, number one, she learned what she could from Jesus. I want to share this passage with you, Luke chapter 10, and it's going to be verses 38 and through 42. And it's the first time that you and I meet Mary of Bethany in Scripture. And we're going to read the passage together, but listen to this. It probably wasn't the first time that Jesus met Mary. Because the Bible says about Mary, Mary, just to give you context, who's Mary of Bethany? Mary of Bethany? Well, she was Martha's sister and Lazarus' sister. So some of you will start to connect to her now. You'll start to put her in her place and understand where she fits. And so this, the Bible says about Martha and Mary and Lazarus that they were close friends with Jesus. You see, they weren't just met Jesus one time and had a few encounters. They would have been spending Shabbats together on Friday nights with Jesus. They would have been having some meals together. They would have been celebrating the festivals together. When Jesus needed respite, when Jesus needed refuge, he went to Bethany to see Mary, to see Martha, to see Lazarus. And so this may be the first time that you and I meet her. But it's probably not the first time Jesus has met her. And so look at the story, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. 
It says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha came in, came, oh, I'm sorry, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and she said, like Martha would, Lord, do you not care that my sister is a lazy bum sitting on her butt right now? What you gonna do about it, Jesus? Oh, I know none of you have done this. None of you have said this to your husband about your kids. Never, never. This has never happened. So she goes on, tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Now before Martha gets a bad name, the way Jesus just answered her is endearing. It wasn't a rebuke like he just did with the disciples when we read earlier. Anytime that, they, that you see in scripture a name repeated, usually it's an intimacy. It's an endearing. Now he's still going to correct Martha. But just so you know, he's saying, oh, Martha, Martha. Martha. And he says it to her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious. The Bible says worried is another word. And troubled about many things. But only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And, and it said, now back in verse 39 when it said, the sister Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Here's what you need to understand in the context of this passage. Because in first century, in Jewish culture, to sit at the feet of a rabbi meant you were a disciple. Let me introduce you to Mary the disciple. Okay? Don't, don't be confused, girls. Jesus had male disciples and he had female disciples. And here's Mary because she had positioned herself as a disciple. She was going to learn what she could from Jesus. The whole point of sitting at the feet of a rabbi was not to tell him which verse to teach her. She wanted to go into her little devotional and say, how, what verse do I feel like reading today? Uh-uh, that's not how it works. I'm going to read the whole thing. I got to know the whole thing. I'm just going to take whatever the rabbi decides I need that day. And she positioned herself at the feet of Jesus so that she could learn what she could. I'm challenging us today, girls. Are you learning what you can from Jesus? I am terrified that we are so consumed about learning about ourselves that we have stepped aside from learning about Jesus. I'm scared to death that we are so self-consumed. Reading so many self-help books, talking about my gifts, my personality, my thing. Now, don't get me wrong. We just talked about my lane. It's all about the motive. It's all if I continue to prioritize myself over learning about Jesus, I will get left behind every single time. Because all I need for the things that are in me that I want to change is Jesus. And the only thing that's going to change me is to learn more about Jesus. When I learn more about Jesus, it will force me to change. It will change me from the inside out. She learned what she could from Jesus. I started to think about this. This was kind of funny to me because I thought, how many of us, no, it's okay. I don't want to embarrass you if you don't feel comfortable. It's fine. But just raise your hand if you would say you are going to spend eternity with Jesus. Now, if you don't. Why is nobody raising their hand? I know I said no, but I mean, if I got a room full of unsaved people, I need to change this message now. We need to go straight to the altar call. I'm teasing, and some of you are going to give your life to Jesus tonight. You won't be able to not. When you hear about this man, God, who came to earth for you, you'll want nothing but him. And so if you say, I think I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus, that's my plan. Lift your hand, lift your hand, right? We, eternity, you know how long that is, right? You know that means like forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It never stops. Eternity. I'm going to spend eternity with this man, this God named Jesus. I, why would you not want to learn about the man you just said you're going to spend eternity with? Don't you think you'd want to know a little bit about this man that you've given your life away for? 
you've surrendered your heart to. She learned what she could about Jesus. I was thinking about that because I want, it's, it's so stirred a fire in me this week. I, I want to learn about who Jesus was, who he is now, and who he's going to be. And as I learn more and more about Jesus, it will transform us. It will heal my marriage. It will heal my finances. It will heal my physical illnesses. It will heal my mind, my mental health. It's going to take care of all of that if I'll just commit myself to learning about Jesus. And I was thinking about this idea of learning more about him because when Kyle and I first met, we first met by phone. So we didn't get to like spend time together, actual physical time together. So all we could do was talk on the phone. We were states apart. And we would call each other the, when we were first getting to know each other. I, but we knew, we knew that we were going to spend the rest of our lives together. Basically because I told him so. <laughs> and so... And so, and that's probably a true story. I mean, I can't really remember, but I'm pretty sure it went down like, you're going to marry me, like it or not, so meet me at the altar. So anyway, so, so we're going to, you know, we know we're going to spend this eternity together, right? Not eternity, sorry. No, no, no. Heck no. So anyway, no, slow down. Jesus, eternity, Kyle, a few more years. So, so we're, we're, we're going to, but we're going to get married. We're going to spend time together. And so we wanted to get to know each other, right? Like, if I'm going to spend my life with you, I probably should get to know you. And we can't do that physically because we're not in the same state. So we would talk for hours and hours on the phone. And I'll never forget, there was one day, I mean, it's that game where we ran out of things to say. But we're just asking, well, which do you like better, this or this? Which do you like better, this or this? And so I'll never forget, I said to him, I don't know why, I said, which do you like better, blondes or brunettes? He did not even hesitate. He did not even take a breath. He's like, blondes. I sat there, like, did he just say blondes? And I remember thinking, I said, well, I don't know if this is going to work then. You're going to be mighty disappointed. And so I, I, I remember I sent him a T-shirt. This is back, do you remember the days when I love blondes, the T-shirts? Do you remember those? And so I sent him in the mail off to South Dakota this T-shirt that said, I love blondes. Because, you know, I was going to play this up for the rest of my life. And then the first day, I, I forgot to mention to you, we had never met in person yet. So for four weeks, you know, we are talking on the phone. So the first time we met, the very first time, do you know what shirt he's wearing? No, no. He had a shirt made that said, I love brunettes. That is the one and only nice thing he's ever done. Since then, I don't know what else he's done. But I wanted to learn more about him. I'm going to spend eternity with him. Jesus. So I want to learn more about him. Not because it changes eternity. Because it will change how I live here on earth. And so here she is. Sitting at his feet. Doing what she could. She learned what she could from Jesus. And the second thing she did was this. She served how she could for Jesus. You see, because here's the story, they're, they're sitting around, they're reclining. We just read it together in Mark chapter 14. And in those days, you didn't sit at tables and chairs. You would have been around the floor. Their head would have been tilted one way and the feet would have came out another. And the, the men were all reclined around the table. And here they are. And the Bible tells us that Mary of Bethany comes in with this alab alabaster jar. She brings it in and she brings in her jar and she begins to serve Jesus. She breaks open her jar, and the Bible tells us that she anoints his head, and she anoints his feet. If you read John and Mark and combine them, that's what you'll get. And here she is breaking open this alabaster jar full of this expensive, fragrant, fragrant oil that was only found in India that the Bible told us probably cost more than a year's wages. And she breaks it open, and she begins to serve Jesus in this moment. And she anoints his head, and she anoints his feet. And I started to think about this because there's this thing where why, why did she pick that moment to serve him? And here's what I want to say. So often you and I come up with the idea that, that we'll do what we can when we want to. <laughs> can I give you a new vision for serving? You go look it up in scripture for yourself. I never saw that serving was about doing what you can when you want to. I always saw that when they served, it was because there was a need or an opportunity. 
they were seizing a moment. That we need to be seizing moments. Serving is about seizing moments. Listen to this. It's so cool because Mary of Bethany knew she needed to seize this moment. How did she know to anoint? Here she, she was anointing Jesus as king, declaring you. That's what the anointing of the head meant. That's how they anointed kings. All through the Old Testament, they would pour oil on their head and anoint them as king. She's declaring in this moment, you are king. But then she begins to anoint his feet with the perfume, preparing him to be buried. How did she know that Jesus was going to die and that she needed to seize the moment to serve and anoint his feet and prepare him for burial? Well, I suggest you go back to point one. She had been learning from Jesus. You see, Jesus had told all of the disciples over and over throughout the scriptures prior to this event. He had been telling them, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to resurrect three days later. I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. They're going to take me out, and I'm going to resurrect. He had told the disciples over and over. They weren't picking it up. But you know who didn't miss it? Mary of Bethany. She did what she could. She had been learning from Jesus. And when we're learning from Jesus, he's not only teaching us the things of the past, he's giving us prophetic vision for what's to come. He'll give you an um, impartation of what the future holds. He'll show you, he'll give you this discernment and sense that you're able to seize the right moments to serve him. And so here's Mary of Bethany, and she's preparing him, and the disciples have no clue what's going on. In fact, they're just mad about it. They're just mad at what she's doing. And, and I want to read it to you, Mark chapter 14, verse 7 through 8, because this proves Jesus is commending her, not just for the act of what she was doing, but for recognizing the moment to do it. Here it is. It goes Mark chapter 14, verses 7 through 8. The poor, Jesus says, you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. See, he's not saying you shouldn't help the poor. He's just saying right now is not the moment for it. L like you're going to miss what you could be doing right now. But you will not always have me, he says. And he already talked about why she knew that, how they weren't picking up on it. And then verse 8, she did what she could. She poured the perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. It's this idea that you have to seize the right moment for serving Jesus, for what he's asking you to do. I want to say this with all the love and grace and humility that I have, which is not that much. I started to think about Mary of Bethany, and I thought, I mean, how would it look today? In today's culture and today with all the stuff we have today, what it, would it look like for Mary of Bethany in that moment to serve Jesus? How many of you know Mary of Bethany is going to be walking up in that room, fixing the tables to make sure it looks a little bit cuter? For the picture. <laughs> and then she's going to walk up to Jesus and she's going to say, Jesus, I'm going to break this on your feet. But before I do, let's get a selfie. And she's going to hold up her alabaster jar. Come on, Jesus, smile. Then she's going to tell the disciples, everybody get around, get around, get around the table. We're going to take another picture. We got to make sure everybody knows what I'm about to do with this alabaster jar. We better make sure this is a real moment, like real R-E-E-L moment, right? Like I, this is a postable moment. I need everybody to know what I'm about to do to serve Jesus. I mean, this is a big moment. When if it's not the right moment to tell everybody, then I'm just not going to do it. And she's got her alabaster jar, and she's telling the disciples, everybody gather around. Judas, smile. <laughs> we'll take the pictures, and she'll be like, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Now I can serve you. Here's the thing I was thinking about. I think if we're not careful, we'll get too fixated on standing out instead of being set apart. And those are not the same. Now, you cannot keep trying to stand out and it naturally fall over into being set apart. You can be set apart and it end up standing out. But girls, we got to hone in on this one. Now, am I saying that you can't post pictures and I can't post pictures and we can't share, you know, the moments that we get to share and what's happening? I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just asking what's the motive. Is it to stand out? Or is it a set-apart holy moment? 
And in this moment, Mary of Bethany knew, I was set apart for this moment. I've been set apart. Set apart just means I'm set aside for something. I'm consecrated. I'm holy. This is a holy moment. And so here she is. She's not trying to stand out in this moment. That wasn't the intention. That wasn't the motive. That's not why she walked up into the room full of men, of male disciples, with the rabbi seated having a nice dinner and decide to break a bottle of perfume over him and begin to anoint him. She wasn't trying to stand out. She was seizing the moment that she was set apart for. And nothing was going to stop her in that moment of doing what she could to serve the Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the love of her life. And so I encourage us tonight that you're called and I'm called to serve how we can for Jesus. Just we have to stop putting off until tomorrow what we can do today. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what it is. I think God will begin to stir that within you. But if, as long as that motive's pure, God will continue to use you for some holy, anointed moments. You and I are called for such a time as this. Right then, when Mary of Bethany sat there and anointed Jesus in that moment, when she broke that bottle over him, that was a prophetic moment. Jesus said, this is preparing me for my burial. Because uh, go, go fast forward in the story, and I know you will because you're going to learn everything you can about Jesus now. So you're going to read the entire Gospels. And so here she is. She's doing this in this moment, capturing and seizing the moment to serve. You fast forward when Jesus is now dead, crucified, and he's gone to the tomb. But now he's resurrected. And here are the other women that show up with their oil ready to prepare him for burial. But he's gone. Like a moment. I'm not saying anything bad about the women because just between you and I, they would go on to be the first to preach the gospel as women. <laughs> they would proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were used for a moment. They served him well. But in that moment, their oil wasn't needed. Their jar wasn't needed. And so we have to stay close to Jesus to know when he's calling us to break the jar. When's the time? What can we do to serve for Jesus? And here's the third and final, and we'll get really close. Number three, she gave what she had to Jesus. You see, we already talked about the story. So here's Mary of Bethany, and she, she's in the room with the disciples, and they're around the table. They're enjoying the meal, and now she's broken open this alabaster jar. Now, what you should understand about the alabaster jar, it did not look like this. This is um, from Common Thread for $3. But it still looked really cute and would prove my point, okay? Alabaster jars did not look like this, but you still get the point. So she had this jar, and what this jar really represented most likely, according to scholars, this jar, as we've already discovered from the passage, was at least worth a year's wages. So let's just say this is an expensive bottle of perfume. This is a $50,000 bottle of perfume. Not only that, it was likely an heirloom. It was likely, think of your most precious possession that has been passed to you, that means something to you, that is special to you. Not only that, there are some believe that it could have been a dowry, which just meant she's saving it. It's a gift from her family to pay, to give as a gift, as a payment to the groom's family for when they get married. This is a very, this is not, she didn't walk over to the shelf and get the, the perfume that she liked the least, that she didn't think smelled good on her, that she'd already used three-fourths of, and take that to the party to anoint Jesus. She grabbed the best thing she had to offer, and she gave what she could to Jesus in that moment. She gave what she could I want to read you about another woman. Let's look at another passage of somebody that gave what they could to Jesus. You'll know the story. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, it says, While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Pause, pause, pause. My giving is just between me and no one. Uh-uh, Jesus standing there over the collection box watching you put it in. I mean, picture it. He's at the temple. He's, this isn't like a private moment. He's standing at the collection box watching everybody give their offering in this moment. And it goes on to say, 
Then a poor widow came by and dropped two small coins. And he says this, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. He's not rebuking the rest. He's not rebuking the fact that the rich were giving. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. She gave what she could in that moment. Here's what I want to say. It's not about the gift. It wasn't about the alabaster jar and how big it was and extravagant it was. It wasn't about that. It wasn't about the fact that it was just two little pennies that she dropped in there. You know what it was about? You know what Jesus cared about? He only cared about the faith that it took to give it and the motive with which they gave. What impressed Jesus about Mary of Bethany, what impressed Jesus about the widow was the faith with which it was going to take to give the gift to Jesus. The trust it was going to take. Think of Mary. What am I going to do when it's time to get married? I already gave it away. Think of the widow. What am I going to do? This is all I have. How do I eat? It wasn't about the gift. It was just the faith that it took to give it and the motive. The motive matters with which they gave. They gave it because they were head over heels in love with a Savior. And they could not for the life of them figure out how to repay him. So they just, she did what she could. She did what she could. She did what she could. I was thinking about a story that I heard recently about this husband and was telling about his wife. And the wife had this special box that she had won. It was a precious box to her. It was a recipe box. And so this recipe box was like a conversation piece. The design that was around it and all the, the embellishments on it and all of these things. It was so precious. She loved it so much that she rewrote all of her recipe cards, hundreds of them, to put in this box to keep on her counter. And then one day she had a young son, and one day she comes home and she sees her boy bright-eyed and wet hands behind him. And she's a little worried of what he's holding. And sure enough, he comes out with this box, but it didn't look like it did now. Now she sees the recipe cards are ripped up and in the trash. And this box, all of the embellishments have been scratched off and colored over. And then he had lined this box with foil then he opens the box and he said, Mom, you mean so much to me. I wanted to give you a gift, so I gave you all I had. I have a little rubber ball. There was a rubber ball in there. There was a picture of him, and there was a little tiny alligator in this box. And he goes, I knew how much you loved this box, so I knew it was the perfect package to decorate and give it to you in. He said, here, I'm giving you what I have. How many of you know that became that mom's favorite box even more than it was before? Why? Because my boy gave me all he had in it, the motive with which he gave it. And it became her special collection box that she would keep all the precious things in and remember forever. And she always said, if there's a fire at my house, there's one thing I'm going in for, and it's not my husband. <laughs> he can find his own way out. It's the box. I was thinking about that, and I thought, what if Jesus had a collection box? I bet he does. I wonder, I just wonder, what would we find in it? What would we find in Jesus' box of all the special things that she did what she could to give him? I was thinking, and I thought, you know, I, I bet we would find in that collection box, I bet we would find all the gold and the frankincense and myrrh that the kings brought to Jesus when he was born, I bet he still has it in that collection box because they gave what they could. And I thought about it. I thought, you know what else? I bet, I bet you'd find the fish and the loaves of the little boy. He had a couple fish. Isn't that good? You can see it. Just kidding. I bet they're in his collection box. 
I bet, I bet the basket that the Samaritan woman left at the well, when she ran off to shout to the entire village to come see the one that told everything she had ever done, I bet he still got that box. I bet he still got the bottle of tears that the woman in Luke 7 cried over his feet. Psalms 56 says he bottles up your tears and keeps them with him. I bet yours are in here every time. I bet he's got an Elvis record because why wouldn't the king of kings like the king? I don't know. I mean, I just saw it. I just saw it. <laughs> Was that sacrilegious? I bet he's still got the rope from the colt that that man gave him to ride into Jerusalem on when they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. You know, I bet, I bet he has all those coins. You know the two, the two mites are in here, but I bet he has all the coins. Did you know that the way Jesus' ministry was supported, he didn't work. It was from the women that learned from him, that supported the ministry, that made sure he had a place to go and food and gave towards the ministry. I bet those, I bet those coins are in there. I, I also bet, I bet the alabaster jar, the broken pieces of the alabaster jars are in there. He kept those. Oh, look, he's even got some of my stuff in here. <laughs> There's that resignation letter. That time that I had a really great paid job. But I knew he was calling me to stay home and learn more about him. I didn't know why. I never pictured this. So I wrote that letter. Just kept it. And that time that we felt called and we had to sign everything we had in our account, we wrote that check with a dream that God could start a church that would change lives. He remembered that gift. Oh, and then there's the time that I remember it wasn't much. I mean, it wasn't that special, but I remember we had to change cars and we had this vehicle and I remember we could have sold it and I kept thinking, man, I sure would love to give it to Jesus somehow. And we found out about a single mom didn't have a car, couldn't get to work, couldn't provide for her family, and it wasn't much. It wasn't worth much, but we gave it to her. Jesus remembers that. He's got this picture of my kids. <laughs> that time I said, Jesus, I give you my family. I give you my kids. No, seriously, Jesus, I'm giving them back to you. Come get them. <laughs> he thought that was funny. What about you? What would you find in your collection box? She did what she could. And Jesus was so pleased. She learned. She served. She gave. She wasn't perfect. She just loved him so much. She loved him so much. And not everybody understood the love. The disciples didn't understand, and they'd been spending time with them. They didn't get it. Why would you give that? Why would you do that? But she loved him so much. She did what she could. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your presence here tonight. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for believing in us when we didn't believe in ourselves. And so today, tonight, we choose to wrestle with that statement you made about Mary. 
She did what she could. May it be said of me, may it be said of us, that she did what she could. Right now, as I continue to pray, I do want to give an opportunity. The first thing that you can do first thing you can do for the Savior is to just surrender to Him. Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with your heart. Give Him your life. That's what He really wants. And so all around this room, if that's you tonight, you've not given your life to Jesus, but you want to. Or maybe you did and it was a long time ago and you don't even know why you're here, just somehow you ended up here. I want to encourage you, you make that decision tonight and surrender to Jesus. If that's you in the room, would you just lift your hand towards heaven? This is between you and the Lord, but I want to know who I'm praying for. I'm going to pray for you. All around the room, if you want to give your life to Jesus, I see your hands. Right where you are, pray this in your heart. Tonight, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my heart. All that I am, I give to you now. Teach me how to live, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. My life is yours. And Father, for the rest of your daughters tonight, I do pray for an impartation to take place, for a fire to be lit on the inside of us to think, God, we don't have to do it all, but we can do something. I don't have to learn it all, but I can learn something. I don't have to serve it all, but I can serve something to you. I, I don't have to give it all, but I can give something. We want to be known for doing what we can. And so would you help us with that, Jesus? You are worthy. You and you alone are worthy. We love you, we honor you, and we give you the glory tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, can you give Jesus some praise tonight? He's so good.